Good morning, Life Point Crossing. How are you doing today? Yeah, I see. I never really even expect people to answer, and that's so delightful when you guys are like, "I'd like to have a happy conversation at 9 a.m. on a holiday weekend." That's fantastic. Yeah, my name's Ross. I'm so glad that you're here. If you're here in person or if you're watching online, you've taken a time out of your weekend to be a part of church and worshiping God. That's this is something that's going to happen in heaven, isn't it? So interestingly, here we are in this series called Heaven on Earth, which we're we're just talking about making earth a little bit more like heaven, which seems like a great idea. At least I thought it seemed like a great idea. And it really comes from reflecting on the most famous line of maybe the most famous prayer that Jesus models for us in what we call the Lord's Prayer. And he says, Father, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so I thought that it kind of struck me, I don't know why it never had before, but that really is a great idea. Let's, yeah, let's, let's do that. We can a little bit have a part in making this happen. Obviously, it's a kind of pie in the sky in the short term in that we're never going to be perfectly able to make earth like heaven. This is still going to be the world where things go wrong and where there's sin and corruption and disease and tragedy and all sorts of things. But as, as far as it relates to us, as, as much as is our, within our ability, we can move toward this in a number of different ways, right? And in doing so, not only do we get to have a part in serving the God who loves us, but also in literally answering the prayer of Jesus. That's crazy. Talk about living a bigger story. Let's be in for this. And my life, my earth could use a little bit more heaven. I don't know about you, so I thought that sounded like a good idea. And so we started this last week by talking about the idea that in heaven, of course, who's at the center? God is at the center. And so that's something that we could all move toward a little bit in our own lives here on earth, is having God be at the center of our lives. And then today is going to be something that is a little bit more practical, and I'm optimistic and, and desperately hopeful that I'm not wrong on this, because I'm wrong sometimes. I'm desperately hopeful that I'm not wrong on this. But I think this is going to be a little bit of an easier message compared to a lot of messages, because I, I don't know about you as people who, you know, I'm sure a lot of you are people who would say you're uh, following Jesus and, and love God. But for sure, as a pastor, there are some elements of Scripture and following Jesus that are able to blend in more than others with sort of the, the greater society that we live in, right? There are some elements of, of Scripture and following Jesus that are just very distinct, sometimes even countercultural or even controversial, and, and so those can be very difficult. But this one today, I think, I, I hope, is going to be a little bit of a softball in the case, or at least in the, in the sense that this is one where really what I think has happened, I don't, a lot of people wouldn't probably agree with this and and I don't think there's any sense in the history lesson to, to prove it or whatever, but I think what's happened really is that a lot of our culture has sort of caught up with the values that are very clear in Scripture to the point where this is something where most of us, I think, are going to come in, hopefully, with some level of agreement. And what I'm talking about is simply this, that everybody has value, right? That Jesus died and resurrected so that anybody from any different background or region or any sort of situation could be forgiven and adopted as a child of God and his family forever. And in, in that way, um, the, the way that I like to say it for today in terms of making earth a little bit more like heaven is just this, that everybody is invited to the party. Guys, do you, do you remember what a good high school party is like? Because I don't. No, apparently I'm not the only one. This is uh, strangely uh, a little bit tragic and a little bit encouraging both at the same time. Um, I, I don't, and it's not really just because I'm getting old and high school is getting further and further away. It's because I was never really at a good high school party. Are the house parties, are they like what they, what they portray on TV? Is that really what, because I don't, I don't know. I really don't know. And I grew up in South Dakota. Uh, we were actually near the Missouri River. There was a little county park down there. And so sometimes people would talk about going and having a party down at the river. And they'd go down there and, and drink or party or do whatever. I, I, like, I don't even know because I was never there. And the biggest reason that I was never there is because this is my actual freshman high school picture right there. And so this isn't a situation, that, yeah, I know, it's okay, you can, you can laugh at that, like we laugh at that. Um, but this wasn't a situation where I didn't realize it was picture day and I just got out of bed, I didn't have time to shower or, or mess with my hair or find a shirt. This was me putting my best foot forward. 
and it turned out that my feet were a little bit awkward. <laughs> okay? Yes, it's okay. You can, you can laugh. You're supposed to laugh at this. It's, it's all right. Uh, you can't be that guy and not develop a sense of humor. Because if you can imagine what his next four years were like, they were a little bit difficult. And so the reason that I never went to a party, by and large, is that I was never invited to the party. And so instead, I just stayed home and tried to drown my sorrows in death metal and cheering for the Detroit Lions. We'll say that was met with what we'll call mixed results. And my high school years did not closely approximate heaven. So this is the kind of thing, really, that I would like to think, I don't even have to like, prove from the Bible, but then if I think about it a little more, I think, like, how else really are we going to know anything about heaven except from Scripture? It's not like I've been personally. And so uh, Revelation can be uh, confusing in a lot of ways, but we're going to drop down for just a moment here in a scene from Revelation chapter 5 that is, is set in heaven. And what we see here, there's kind of a lot going on, but there's a scroll that's sealed and has been determined that there's nobody who's worthy to open the seal or break the seal, except for, it mentions a lamb that looks as though it's been slaughtered. And so there's a lot going on here, there's a lot of depth, but what we need to understand for today is clearly that, that lamb that looks as though it's been slaughtered is a clear picture of Jesus, right? And, and so here's what, here's what we see. See, and there's, there's people around, and the people, this is they, this is people, they sang a new song with these words. They said, you, and this of course meaning Jesus, the lamb that looks as though he's been slain, said, you are, you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. And it says, for you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God. And, and this is really kind of where we're going. From every tribe and language and people and nation. Okay, this is, this is saying that Jesus died for people from every tribe and language, people and nation, all kinds of people. And then if we pick up and we drop down right about two chapters later in chapter 7, there's a, another scene, and now you can see that all those people who he died to ransom, hey, good news, they, they actually made it. They showed up. It says, after this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count. And who's, who is this crowd made up of? Is, here we are, people from every, and it's the exact same four words. They're in a different order, but it's the exact same four words. Every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne before the Lamb, right where they're supposed to be. And so I know there's a lot of questions in Revelation, and on some level, I only have so many answers. But here, I think, is what's very clear and very explicit. Is that Jesus, the lamb who was slaughtered, man, he, he died for people from every kind of, any kind of, as much variety as possible, any place, any language, any region, any background. And then you see two chapters later, and, and they're actually there worshiping around the throne. And listen, if you were here, we talked a couple months ago about Jesus saying that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with what? With all your heart and soul and mind and strength. And we said, this is just, he's, he's just saying, we can break this down in any number of ways, but really he's just saying, listen, this is, this is all of you. Like all of your alls is the way to love God. Don't try and look through those words, heart, soul, mind, and strength, and say, okay, now what, what did he not mention? With what do I not have to love God? Is, is, what's really inappropriate here? And I would say the same thing with these four words here. Don't, you know, you look at those and be like, all right, well, it doesn't mention, it doesn't say anything about Broncos fans. <laughs> so I wonder if God's grace really extends to them. He's, this is saying, everybody, all sorts of people. And not only that, they're, they're not only together there in heaven worshiping around the throne, but they're actually unified. And what's interesting about that is it's not even their, their similarities or their diversity in which they're unified. It's not their homogeneity nor their differences. It's just like we talked about last week. They're all just centered on God. It's, it's really God is the one who's the unifier. And so I would like to think that we all know and understand this. And you guys, if there's someone here who needs to hear this this morning, please do hear it. But everybody is invited to the party. Everybody's loved. Everybody's valued. Everybody's unified. If you don't want to worship and spend eternity with people who might look and sound a little different from you, then this is a great day for you to make earth a little bit more like heaven. 
and decide that we're just going to embrace this. And, and I know a lot of different things, especially in, on the topic of race, in, in our world have really kind of been crazy, both in the last few years and like kind of since the beginning of time, like really kind of all of that. Uh, but I really, I'm not trying to say anything political. I, I don't think I'm trying to say anything really even the tiniest bit controversial. I'm just saying that everybody's loved, everybody's valued, everybody is invited to the party. And there's more to this message. We're going to see, go, go some different places, but more to this than just race. But uh, for, for just a, a couple of moments, um, and I, I grew up, as I mentioned, in South Dakota, overwhelmingly white, naturally. Uh, and I did have the good fortune of being taught from a young age that racism was stupid and wrong. And so, of course, I believed that. But I also didn't really see a lot. And so I also sort of developed a belief and an understanding that it was kind of a thing from, you know, history books and, you know, from a bygone era and wasn't really a thing in the modern world until later in life when Laura and I moved and we lived for eight years in Louisville, Kentucky, which was, of course, much more racially diverse and much more racially tense. And frankly, I was shocked at some of the things that I saw and experienced there. And so I do understand that this is a reality in our world. I have a Facebook friend actually this week who lives not even far from here. He's in Northwest Arkansas and he's black and he had a, a status update that just said polite racism is very alive and well. And he's somebody I know, he's not someone who goes around looking for stuff. So I, I absolutely understand this is a reality in many, many ways in our world, in, in our culture. At least openly and publicly, though, it does seem to me that our society has come to embrace the idea of everybody is valuable, right? At least in the sense, that, this is, I think, at least easy to preach in the sense that I would be very surprised if any of you go home and write me an angry email disagreeing with that idea. I'm not at all concerned about a social action group hearing about the message and then protesting that LifePoint Crossing is the place where everybody's valued, everybody's invited to the party. That would be fairly absurd in our society, right? And so, Here's what I do want to drill down on a little bit in that, is let's, let's not believe this, though, because it's a value that our society has been coming to embrace. Let's not believe this because of the cultural value that has been emerging in our society. Let's believe this because it's biblical. And that even when the church, and even where the church, doesn't believe this or act on this, that it's still always and always has been real and true. And it was true during colonial slavery, and it was true during Jim Crow, and it was true during Nazi Germany, and it, whatever the world looks like in a hundred years or a thousand years, it will still be true. And with that as a starting point, though, what makes the perspective of a Christ follower different from anybody else on the street who would echo this same very, very wonderful and very, very correct belief that, that everybody has value? Um, and um, here I think what we have is really something very unique and very interesting and very important, which is a reason that exists outside of ourselves. Because why does everybody have value? In fact, why does anybody have value? And I've read a, not a lot, but a little bit of atheism, for instance, and like, certainly there's no one belief that you know, can speak for anybody in a group or movement or category or, or anything like that, the same way that there's no one person who speaks for Christianity other than Jesus, and you know, people argue about that too. But I, I've seen answers that I, 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 they just aren't, to me, even the tiniest bit satisfactory. And why does anybody have value? Because we all feel like we do, don't we? And this isn't heaven yet, stuff gets messed up. But deep down, don't we all know and understand and believe that we have value and in fact that the other people around us also have value? Where does that come from? 
It's a little bit hard to explain, isn't it? And I, I don't particularly care what anybody thinks about the mechanics of how the human race came to be here, um, but at least in the, the strictly naturalistic evolutionary sort of understanding, right, that says that everything, all of the universe existing and life in like, any level is just a complete accident that had no sort of divine initiative or interaction with anything because there is no God, no divine anything. The answer, I think, is exactly the same as their answer for basically literally everything, which is that, well, it was beneficial, right? That somewhere along the way, some, our ancestors' ancestors began to develop the belief that life and human beings have value and, and have worth, and so that belief made them more likely to struggle through and survive and have babies of their own, which then they passed on the belief that human beings have value and uh, intrinsic worth. And so... Um, this is really the idea that we believe that we have value because we believe that we have value. Like it really is this circle that sort of is my, I am my own grandpa kind of thing that's really based in nothing but itself. And so I think even if you ask any average person on the street, whatever they believe, if, if they're atheist or you know, follow Jesus or any other anything, I think if you ask most people, they would agree, right, that yes, human beings have value. Oh, absolutely. But if you ask them why, again, even as Christ followers, I think generally, man, people might struggle really to give much of an answer. Like, what's, what's that based on? What, why, why is that the case? I don't really know what anybody would say, but I suspect that most people, and, and maybe even most of us, like, I, I mean, we feel this like so strongly. I mean, we, we would almost say we know it's true, but I don't, how do you really base that on something. And so scripture, look, the good news, gives us actually, I think, an outstanding answer. And it doesn't wait until Revelation. It actually comes from literally page one. And I don't care particularly how anybody thinks about the first couple chapters of Genesis for today, but don't miss what it very explicitly does point us to. I think, I think this is very clear. I think this is very profound and very helpful from Genesis 1, 26 and 27, two verses here. And it says, then God said, let us make human beings, and here's this phrase, in our image, to be like us. And they will reign over, listen, they're going to be distinct from everything else in all of creation. They'll reign over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the ground and the small animals that scurry over along the ground. And so God says that, and so then, of course, God does that, and he says, so God created human beings, and here it says again, in his own image. Now a third time, just in these two verses, in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Three times, just in these two verses, it points directly to this, super highlights this idea that we're created in the image of God. If you've heard the Latin phrase, imago Dei, that's what that means. That's, that's where that comes from. And you can see this is just making a huge point out of this idea. And to this point in creation, everything else has already been created. Everything else already exists, but there's been no mention at all of this idea of anything being created in the image of God. And so humans are different and this is exactly what is different about them. And it doesn't answer all of our questions, but it's interesting that if you keep reading, you don't get too much further before you see this actually come up again. And I think this is really very helpful. In Genesis 9, 6, it says, if anyone takes a human life, that's serious, and here's why. It says, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. Why? Well, here's the answer. For God made human beings, and it was this exact same idea, in his own image. The reason why it's an extra super big deal for violence to be done against a human being is why. This is why. Because we're made in his image. Because we carry around, each one of us, a unique reflection of who he is wherever we go and whatever we do just based on the fact that we are a human being. This, this is why we have value and why we have unique value. This is what separates us from everything else that's been created, is because every one of us here today and every one of us who's ever lived was created in the image 
of the creator of the universe. It's not something we are just automatically. It's not something we can work for and achieve and unlock like a badge in a video game. It's something that's put in each one of us by our creator. This is really a pretty good answer. And it seems a little bit, maybe kind of like technical, theological, not really practical, but it really does turn out, I think, to be a very, very helpful answer because this now also gives us a framework to consider and a question to ask in terms of how do you even start to think about some of these questions that can be very difficult and, and maybe questions that you've asked and not had a good answer to or maybe questions that some of us are, are even afraid to ask because we don't know if there's a good answer or we're afraid of what an answer might, might or might not be because we, it's, it's wonderful that we believe, I think it's right that we believe all people are equally valuable, but like, we, we aren't. I, I mean, how do you consider equal? Because, I mean, just realistically, like, all people are not equally productive. I mean, pr productivity, that's important, that's valuable, isn't it? Have you ever worked at a job where everybody did the exact same quantity and quality of work? I mean, even if you're paid exactly the same, which I've worked a bunch of bad jobs, I've worked a bunch of jobs like that, and I will tell you, everybody is not equally valuable at work. <laughs> um, I mean, different people have different levels of intelligence. I mean, some people are more intelligent than other people. That's valuable, isn't it? Oh, that's, that's super valuable. We 100% we value that. So would somebody be more or less valuable based on their intelligence? Well, I know you, you want to say no. Of course you do. Immediately you say, no, that can't be right. I, I, you, you desperately don't want that to be There's no way that can be right. And, and of course we agree. But why not, right? Like, isn't that something that's of value? Or here's something that I actually think as a society, we maybe really tend to undervalue. And this is actually even distinct from a lot of different cultures in societies, even in our world currently. But I think, and if you think about it, most of us would agree, but we tend to undervalue older people, don't we? And in our society, we tend to really elevate and super value youth. And it's not necessarily that we don't want to value youth, but if you consider two societies and one has particular honor for the elderly and one has particular honor for youthfulness, how do you think about that? Like who's, who's right? Is one of them wrong or is one of them more right than the other? How, how, how do you even consider that? Well, this gives us really a wonderful and very helpful framework and a question to ask for understanding that. So a, a younger person or an older person, is one of them more valuable than another? Should one of them be celebrated or, or considered more worthwhile than another? Well, now we can really consider this. Is one of them more human than another? Is one of them carry more of the image of the creator God than the other? Well, this is going to be very helpful now because we can answer the question. Well, no, they're equally human. They equally carry the image of the creator God. And so now we can really understand there's a, a solid reasoning for saying, okay, yes, you know what? Absolutely. Both equally incredibly valuable. And so how helpful is that? Here's one where I think our society's actually made great progress in the last couple decades, even that I've been around and sort of paying attention, is with recognizing the value of what we call people who have special needs, right? Isn't this something where in so many places around the world and even in our own history, special needs people were not valued at all. They, they were really seen as a drain on resources and in many places in the world still are. Well, I, listen, I know so many of you have actually opened up your own homes and, and adopted people with special needs, kids with special needs. There was a time when Laura and I actually offered to adopt a child who was not developing properly uh, prenatally and the mother was in a really, really difficult spot and didn't know what to do. And so we did it's like, okay, well, this is going to be a person who has value. And I'm very happy to say that right now, LifePoint Crossing Church is working, taking active steps towards having a place in the kids' ministry specifically for kids with special needs so they can have as big of a part and be as valued as is possible. And that's wonderful. And I feel like actually most of our society at this point would celebrate that. But, but why? Right? Why, why would we see it that way? It's very simple because they're a human being created in the image of the Almighty God. I think that's the answer. I think that's the whole answer. I think that's as far as you have to go 
Revelation 5, Jesus died for people as, as much variety as there is variety of people. And then two chapters later, Revelation 7, there they all are. Everybody made it. People from every sort of variety that you can imagine. And I know I just brought up some things that I can't answer about that. Like, what age will you be in heaven? I, okay, I don't know. I, I don't know. Like, if you, what, where is your physical or mental capacity going to be like in heaven? Okay, I, I don't know. But everybody's valued. Everybody's loved. Everybody is invited to the party. And the place where I feel that today really has to go to end, because this, and this is just incredible when we look at a message like this, at least to me. Um, yeah, I, don't, maybe it's, I don't think it's just because I'm a pastor, um, because I, man, I, I, love the, I think the Bible's incredible. But if you go to the very last page of the Bible, which you don't get to very often, but we just started on literally page one, in Genesis 1, right? If we go to the very last chapter of Revelation, you know what you find? And these aren't the exact last verses, but this is the, the very last chapter. Is you find an incredible, clear, compelling invitation. This is amazing. Revelation twenty two seventeen: the spirit and the bride say, come. Let anyone who hears this say, Come, and who can come? Let anyone, anyone who's thirsty come. Let anyone who desires drink freely from the water of life. This is as inclusive as can possibly be hoped for. And Revelation is hard, but the Spirit and the Bride, the ones to, the Spirit, I think that just means the Spirit of God. That's the, what we call the third person of the Godhead. That, that is itself God. What's the Bride? I think Scripture talks of the church, us, the, the people who follow Jesus on the earth as the Bride of Christ. So this is the Spirit, and the, this is God and His church, and here we are, and, and we're together, and we're in agreement. And here's what we're saying. You guys, Come come. It's even, it's even stronger than just like you're invited, like you can come if you want to. This is, this is an act. Of, please come. We want you. You're valued. You're loved. You're important. You, and we agree on this. It's, it's not about who you are or who you're not. It's not about what you have done or what you have not done. It's whoever you are, whatever you are. You guys, we, we, we want you to come. Who can it be? Anyone. God and his church. We're in agreement. This is for you. The lamb that looks like it had been slaughtered. That's Jesus Christ. That is a picture of him having absorbed justice for sin on your behalf. It's done. The party's set. Like the catering, the direction, the, the, the decorations, they're already, they're done, they're paid for. You guys, did, did you see the party? We want you to come. Please. It's for you. And, and not just, not just the general everybody. For you. That's why you come. Father, thank you so much that you've called us to come. Thank you so much for the lamb that was slaughtered to cover justice for each of our sin and wrongdoing so that we could be the people you have created us to be and most accurately reflect the image of yourself that you've placed within us. Thank you that you give us that opportunity and not only the opportunity, but that you call us actively to come. If you're, if you're here today and you've never taken that first step to respond to that invitation, it is for you and it is, you guys, it's done. All you have to do is step into it and accept. Send in that RSVP. Every one of us, you know that we've sinned. There have been things, we, they were wrong. We knew they were wrong. We did them anyway. And that destroys any chance we can have of a relationship with the perfect and just creator God. But that's why justice was fulfilled by Jesus who came and died and was resurrected to absorb justice for our wrongdoings. And it's right, right here where you are. You can sit and you can talk to God out loud or you can even just pray silently to him. He will hear you. Say, God, I believe that Jesus Christ came and died and rose again 
so I could be forgiven and adopted as a child in your family forever. Please forgive me and adopt me. Come into my life. Begin to make me into the person you created me to be and give me the life that you have for me. And if you just prayed a prayer like that for the first time, it's not the words or the prayer that saves you. It's that you put your faith in Jesus. God will respond to that. You're a new spiritual creation, forever changed. And you have a place in the party. If you would, just the best thing you can do is to go out to the point after we're done here. That's just the corner in the lobby. And talk to Trinessa or whoever will be out there and let them know that you made the decision so we can follow up with you and have you taking some healthy steps toward a path toward, toward the relationship with God and the life that he has for you. And we're so excited for what he's doing in your life. And for the rest of us, oh, I, I hope this message was a message for nobody today. But man, if this was a message for you, Will you step into and embrace the idea that, you know what, everybody's invited, everybody's valued, everybody's loved. And the sooner you step into that, the sooner you accept that and move and press play on that in your life, man, the, the more like heaven your life will be, the more like heaven the, this earth will be, and the more you will reflect that image of God in your life. Whoever you are, wherever we are, just, just right now, take, take this moment to commit between you and God. Man, we're going to be a part of this. We're going to be a part of bringing heaven to earth in this way. Everybody's loved, everybody's valued, everybody's invited. Father, we're, we're so grateful that you've invited everybody. We're so grateful you've invited us, me. None of us deserve your grace. None of us deserve your love. We accept. We come. We're grateful to be a part. And in response, we can do no less than offer our entire lives and everything that we are in your service and for your great glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. All right, friends, thank you.